A stroke may be severe, debilitating, and life-altering, but new treatments offer hope. Advancement in the treatment of strokes. Tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening, and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. Tonight's topic is stroke. There are many risk factors for stroke. Some we can control, and some we cannot. Which leads me to tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. Which of the following is the single most important controllable risk factor for stroke? A, smoking. B, high blood pressure. C, high cholesterol. D, diabetes. Or E, obesity. Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a copy of the book, The Picture of Health. Each of Dr. Holmes' essays, originally written for On Call with Prairie Doc, comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We will announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in. We answer your questions about strokes and their treatment as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Joining us tonight in studio is Dr. Alex Lin with Avera Medical Group Brain and Spine Institute in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Dr. Lin, thanks so much for coming. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, talk about stroke and how it's uh, a critical emergency in which uh, treatment is uh, so important to get as quickly as possible and uh, looking forward to talking about it. Yeah. Starting off, if you wouldn't mind telling me a little bit about your background. Absolutely. So I'm a Midwest boy by trade. I was uh, born and raised in Norfolk, Nebraska, grew up in the Midwest and uh, uh, went on to uh, do my medical training at uh, various places throughout the country and in some cases some e even some international locations. and. Uh, managed to find my way back to uh, the Midwest and uh, in this case Sioux Falls which is really close to my home region and I consider it my home region. How long was your training? Uh, so uh, everybody asks this question and the, I guess the easiest way to put it is uh, about 15 years if you uh, count from high school until the time that I was completely done. Wow, yeah. And do you feel fully prepared? Uh, yes, most of the time but um, uh, in some cases, I still have to call some that are uh, more experienced than me to, uh, to get some opinions on things that sure. uh, they have seen more often. Sure. Uh, and is it nice to be back in the area, back, back in the home area here? Most definitely, absolutely. And it's nice to have uh, family close by. Good, good. So what, what is a stroke? So a stroke uh, can be divided into kind of two different uh, sections. Uh, there is ischemic strokes where a blood vessel is being blocked or occluded by uh, uh, sometimes a, a, an embolic material of something that traveled into the vessel or in some cases a small vessel that dysfunctions in the brain and occludes. Uh, and in a uh, lesser uh, percentage of cases, about 13% of the time, it's related to a hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, in which a blood vessel, small blood vessel, typically ruptures or a brain aneurysm ruptures into the, into the brain. And it's these two uh, major categories that we refer to in stroke. So the hemorrhagic one being a bleeding one, and you mentioned an aneurysm. So what, what is an aneurysm? Yep, so an aneurysm is um, a frightening term for, for people that hear it, particularly cerebral aneurysm. When someone finds out they have one, uh, they become very worried about it because uh, people have heard about brain aneurysms rupturing and how dangerous they are. But what an aneurysm is, is a weak spot in a blood vessel wall that in, in most cases pouches out into a sac-like shape. Okay, and then unfortunately sometimes they can Sometimes rupture. they'll rupture and interestingly, um, they, they only will rupture, uh, in most cases, about 1 to 2 percent of the time uh, on an annual basis. So a lot of aneurysms might never exactly. cause a problem. Most aneurysms we will monitor and they will never rupture or cause a problem and risk factor control can help keep them from doing that. So the ischemic stroke was the, the blocked stroke and the hemorrhagic stroke was the bleeding stroke. You got Which it. is more common? Uh, definitely the ischemic stroke by far. And how, how often, how common are strokes? Uh, so if you look at the uh, most recent list from the CDC Centers for Disease and Control, 
uh, out of Atlanta, they'll, they'll tell you uh, currently stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States, actually used to be fourth. Um, so I don't know if we're doing better or a different disease process is mm -hmm. worse. Uh, it kills about 140,000 Americans each year, which uh, accounts for one out of every 20 deaths. And approximately 800,000 people per year in the United States will have a stroke, and 600,000 of those or so is their first time with stroke. Uh, one area in which we work really hard on is uh, preventing recurrent stroke, and it puts people into a category uh, that you and I both manage, which yeah. is secondary stroke prevention. Uh, but unfortunately, one in four people will go on to have another stroke. Oh. And so we do our best to try to prevent that, um, but sometimes, uh, no matter what we do, it can happen again. One other interesting uh, fact to mention is that the cost to the United States healthcare system per year related to stroke is $34 billion. Uh, and it is a leading cause of long-term disability. Yeah. So what are the symptoms of a stroke? So the symptoms that I like to refer to, um, I always use the term sudden. So it's typically sudden and onset. Um, so in the case of a, an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke in the brain, um, it is typically the sudden onset changes in speech or speech production. Sometimes it's understanding speech that someone's uh, speaking to you. Um, sudden onset weakness of one side of the body, uh, face, arm, and leg, and that could be uh, weakness in the extremities. Uh, it could also be sensation, sen sensation changes as well. Um, those are the major uh, signs and symptoms, and even vision onset, so sudden onset blacking out of vision, uh, one or both eyes, uh, can sometimes be a sign of stroke as well. Okay, and so, um, you know, one caller asked, if you're more likely to have a stroke if there's a family history of it. So what are the, the, the risk factors? For yeah, stroke? there's definitely a genetic component to stroke, um, but most of it are really acquired things. Um, there are some syndromes that are associated with stroke, one of them being Catacel, and there's some other examples of them. Um, but uh, the major risk factors for stroke typically are acquired, and those are things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, uh, smoking cigarettes is a very well-known associated uh, risk factor for stroke and aneurysm development and these things. Um, and in addition to those, uh, you could go a step further and uh, diet and exercise are also very uh, important risk factors. So not exercising is a risk factor in and of itself and poor diet as well. Yeah. You mentioned that, um, that, that if you've had a stroke, you're more likely to have another one. One caller had asked that they thought maybe they had had a, a TIA, a transient ischemic attack or a mini stroke where, you know, the symptoms come and then di disappear on their own. Mm -hmm. Now, does that increase your risk of having a stroke? It does, assuming that the TIA was a bona fide TIA. So in, in the stroke world, uh, we um, define it as a TIA and a stroke are really the same thing from a mechanistic standpoint. So the process that's actually happening, a blood vessel blocking, or whatever the case may be, it's the same process. The only difference between a TI and a stroke is that the occluded blood vessel or the blocked blood vessel actually uh, restores flow before irreversible damage sets in. So TI and stroke are the same thing, just different in the sense that it luckily reverses before permanent damage sets in. And so if it was indeed a bona fide TIA process related to some sort of ischemic process in the brain, then yes, absolutely, it does increase the risk for a repeat event. So if you're having these symptoms of a stroke, weakness, trouble talking, balance issues, vision loss, what should we do? Uh, seek help right away, call 911. Um, don't call your neighbor, don't call your, uh, your friend or family member, you need to call 911 uh, because you gotta get help right away. In the cases of ruptured aneurysms, for example, if the aneurysm, uh, if somebody has a sudden onset headache or what we refer to as a thunderclap headache and they don't call for help right away and try to wait it out, if, if that truly was a ruptured aneurysm and it kept bleeding, people can lose consciousness. Um, so when stroke, tim so stroke symptoms set in, you need to call and get help right away. Don't wait around. We were talking to the, the college students here before we came in, and you mentioned how the brain, those brain cells can die fairly quickly, it sounds like. Yeah, really, uh, the brain cells themselves, within a matter of probably five minutes, if they don't get any oxygen at all, which is uh, oxygen carried by blood flow, so interruption of blood flow for more than about five minutes, it does cause irreversible damage to those cells and they die and they never come back. Uh, and the brain is different from every other organ in the body in that it doesn't regenerate. Uh, the reason people actually recover from stroke is that over time, the cells which stay intact uh, learn to do the job that the ones that had died. 
Um, and the only reason why some of the treatments that exist for stroke, because obviously somebody's not going to get to the hospital in no. five minutes, right? So we have right. two acute treatments that can be given uh, within a reasonable time for stroke. And the reason that people can hang on long enough to do that is because there is uh, some really amazing collateral pathways, uh, or what we refer to as the word leptomeningeal, vessels which get flow around the blockage or the occlusion in some cases and, and buy people more time uh, gotcha. so that they can't get treatment. So it's, it's bad enough that it's causing dysfunction and the clinical symptoms, uh, but not bad enough yet that it may not be uh, reversible up to a period of time. So it's just like if we're driving down the road and there's an accident or there's road construction, the blood flow can exactly. find a different way around it's just for a slower while, to get there. but it's just slower to get there. And, eventually, and we do want to fix that yes, highway, don't we? Yes, and do it as quickly as possible because eventually uh, it's going to be such a pileup of cars that it is an irreversible problem. Yeah. yeah, well we are going to talk about how we get around that, that accident uh, after this here. We've been discuss as we've been discussing, there's been considerable advancements in the treatment of strokes. Prairie Doc reporter Tori Burnt spoke with an Iowa woman who says she's lucky to be alive thanks to a new procedure and the timeliness of receiving treatment. I woke up in the morning and I couldn't get out of bed. I struggled and struggled to get out of bed by myself. Finally made it. I knew my husband wouldn't hear me because he had the TV blaring, so he wouldn't hear me. So I got to the bathroom and um, I just kind of slid down on the floor and couldn't get up. And that's when him and my, one of my granddaughters came and tried to get me up. So they got me to the couch. They called 911. And before I knew it, you know, I was over at the emergency room. I just know our emergency room did everything they were supposed to. The doctor, Lynn, met me at the helicopter. He said, rest me into surgery. So I'm in. It's just like zip, zip, zip. 71-year-old Nancy Babel had an acute ischemic stroke on May 15th at 7.45 a.m. at her home in Esterville, Iowa. She was transported by helicopter to Sioux Falls, and by about noon, Dr. Alex Lynn was removing the stroke, a blood clot, from her brain, a surgical procedure called endovascular thrombectomy. Well, I had a blood clot that broke off, so it went up into my brain, on the right side of my brain, and they went through um, my leg, up into my brain and he somehow he suctioned out all that blood and um, saved my life. I mean, it was a pretty serious thing, I guess. So I could do everything they asked me. Little weak the next day, I guess, but otherwise I could do lift my arms and legs and put pressure on them and yeah. So I was very, very fortunate. It's been just over four months since her major stroke and Nancy is pretty much back to normal, walking as much as possible and planning a cardiac rehab routine. I didn't have any um, after effects of the stroke. Except when I forget something now, I say, oh, you know, I had brain surgery, so. Thank you, Nancy and Dr. Lynn. Thank you for connecting us with one of your patients. Nancy's stroke recovery was going really well, but then I understand there was another turn in events that prevented her from leaving the hospital. What was that all about? Well, interestingly, while we were uh, looking into rehab options for Nancy to get her better, um, because of COVID-19, we've had to routinely test all patients to go to either a rehab facility for stroke uh, or a nursing facility after being in the hospital. And lo and behold, Nancy's one of these uh, patients who surprisingly uh, tested positive for COVID-19 and even tested positive on a repeat test, so it was very legitimate. Um, and she had absolutely minimal symptoms of it, uh, but yet she tested positive. Could the stroke have been related with the COVID-19? It, it is actually possible. Uh, in her particular case, I think it was probably related to something else, but there could be an indirect association. Uh, what we have learned in the last six months uh, with this COVID-19 pandemic is that uh, COVID-19, particularly in severe cases in which patients have really severe respiratory issues, um, it is associated with clotting of blood vessels uh, and I've even seen a, a few examples in which clot literally forms on uh, cholesterol plaques and vessels and grows and then ends up embolizing into the brain. Wow. Um, and so 
You know, you talk about, uh, r r we touched a little bit on risk factors for stroke, but I'd like to touch on that a little bit more. Um, like an irregular heart rhythm, atrial fibrillation, how can that cause a stroke? So the way in which atrial fibrillation or AFib uh, or A-flutter leads to a stroke is uh, there is an improper balance in the way that the, the heart is beating. And so on the left side of the heart, uh, there's the atrium chamber and then the ventricle chamber, which is on the bottom in the larger chamber. And my cardiology friends will tell you that, you know, your lower chamber, the ventricle, is, is the one that does 90% of the work. So you may go in and out of AFib and not know it. Uh, and that's because you're just losing a little bit of pumping function from that upper chamber, the atrium. But what happens is when that atrium chamber vibrates and doesn't uh, allow for the coordinated pumping of blood flow, blood can stagnate on the side, side of the uh, chamber and then eventually if it kicks back into rhythm it pushes that clot out, ends up in the larger chamber and then pushes out into the bloodstream. And just the way anatomy is, uh, as the blood clot would come out of the heart into the aorta, uh, the vessels which go to the brain are a straight shot up and this is how uh, patients can end up with a large blood vessel blocked because of a clot that actually came from the heart. So let's say that happens and someone has symptoms of a stroke, which one viewer asked, what does fast mean in relation to a stroke? So we'll recap that uh, again here. What, what, is, what is that? Absolutely. So fast is a, it's part of a movement from the American Heart and Stroke Association and trying to get uh, our community to understand the signs and symptoms of the stroke and make sure that they understand to act quickly. And so FAST stands for, and again my key word is sudden onset, sudden onset changes in the face, so facial droop for it would be the F, uh, sudden onset changes uh, in A for arm weakness or sensation loss, but this particularly includes the leg as well. Uh, S would be sudden onset changes in speech function, uh, being able to express speech, salute speech, or understand speech. And T is simply a reminder for time, that time is of the essence, you've got to call for help right away because the ability to get treatments is time limited. So a person recognizes that, they call 911, they get to the emergency room, then what? So then, uh, this is a process that's actually really uh, changed a lot, particularly over the last five to ten years of how stroke patients uh, uh, are worked up uh, and we identify what's truly going on. Uh, when I was a neurology resident uh, a number of years ago now, when I first started, the process in which we use was different. Uh, patients would come into the emergency room, uh, neurology would be alerted right away as well as the ER team and we would evaluate the patient um, use a scoring system known as the NIH stroke scale or NIHSS and quantify how severe the stroke symptoms were. Then we would go do imaging pictures of the brain typically with a CAT scan. Uh, now the process has shifted. Now we go directly to the CAT scanner as soon as a patient arrives and the teams converge at that point. So a neurologist, an ear doctor, uh, and, as well as the nursing staff will all meet at the CT scanner, begin assessing the patient at the same time as we're preparing for imaging. This has really changed the game because now we get an immediate idea if this is an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke, which more quickly uh, helps guide us in the right direction in terms of treatment. Sure. Just as a reminder, this is your program and your questions are key to our program. So please call us at our number at one 888-376-6225. And so, um, so now the, uh, the, they've identified a, a, on the CT scan mm -hmm. that they had a stroke. Yep. And, and why do we need to do a CT scan for sure anyway? So the idea of the CT scan, uh, and if we want to pull up an image, uh, early stroke changes on plain CT scan, um, it can be very subtle, but the idea of doing imaging is really to determine um, uh, which type of stroke it might be. And if you, for example, if you have a hemorrhagic stroke, uh, you're not going to be a candidate for the cl strong clot busting medication known as TPA. It's going to be a different treatment paradigm. Uh, whereas if you um, have a hemorrhagic stroke, uh, we're going to be, you know, more focused on lowering blood pressure and trying to get to the bottom of what blood vessel ruptured. You know, was it an aneurysm or what is the process exactly that's going on? So the changes can be very, very subtle on the CT uh, scan. Uh, if we have the image uh, hyperdense vessel sign on plain CT or early stroke changes on plain CT, we could show that. 
Um, they are very subtle changes sometimes, but they're very helpful in order to determine what the process is so we can guide the direction of here care. Here we've got a... Oh, so this we is, got the video here. This is the video of a hemorrhagic stroke, and we can just keep playing it here. So in, the case, in this case, a person had a hemorrhage into the brain, and it was caused by a fistula, which is a brain malformation. So you can see here we're kind of taking pictures of the problem, and eventually we're going to block the occlusion uh, with an embolic type of glue called onyx. So you'll see that shortly here. Here it is. So it goes much slower than this. This is uh, sped up. This is in fast frame mode. Uh, but this process probably took about 45, 60 minutes. You can see the embolic glue material actually disconnecting the artery to vein misconnection, which caused this person's hemorrhage. So this is where it's bleeding in the brain. So it bled into the brain. It caused uh, hemorrhage and we occluded the lesion with the symbolic material coming from the inside of the body. So we disconnected the malformation. And blocked the bleed. Yep, exactly. So then the damage isn't done. So it can't bleed anymore, you got it. And at the end you can see the, the wow. flow is there and there's no more fistula present. This is afterwards. You can see the hemorrhage there and you can see some of the material. And the patient did great. Um, we were able to get to that problem, fix it fast enough uh, so that it couldn't bleed again. So we, we can do something if it's a ischemic stroke with a blockage mm -hmm. or if it's a hemorrhagic stroke. Absolutely. Uh, not all hemorrhagic strokes are caused by a secondary structural lesions, but the ones in which they are uh, are sometimes amenable to this minimally invasive neuroendovascular therapy, such as uh, I provide, uh, and sometimes also uh, are amenable to neurosurgical techniques, uh, which have been around for a lot longer time. Wow. And so... Um, so with that CT, they're, they're able to see, like you said, if it looks like it's bleeding or if it's like a, a singular mm -hmm. event. And uh, uh, Lowell, if you would bring up early stroke changes on plain CT and then hyperdense vessel sign on plain CT. And, uh, and so that would be interesting to compare, compare those. So in the case of a ischemic stroke, mm -hmm. so where there's the blockage, what can we do then? So this, this picture that's actually showing up here, if you just see the arrows uh, on, on your left or the screen's right-hand side, those little yellow arrows are showing how subtle the changes in early stroke can be. So that's an area called the insula within the brain on, on a person's right side of their brain. And those are early subtle changes in stroke. And there's another one we could show uh, that's titled hyperdense vessel sign. Uh, sometimes on CAT scan, even a plain CAT scan, you can see yeah, there's that arrow showing that area there uh, on a person's uh, right middle cerebral artery. That's actually a vessel which has stagnant flow because it's occluded, so there's actually no flow in this case. And sometimes the clot is actually bright, uh, as it is in this case. So without even highlighting the vessels, we can see that this person has what's called a hyperdense vessel sign. Uh, and this is a sign that there's a big vessel that's blocked up. And so when this happens, there are uh, two treatment paradigms in ischemic stroke. So as long as the CT scan shows no hemorrhage uh, and it shows potentially early signs like what we saw here, um, there are two treatments that somebody can get if they get to the hospital soon enough. They may be a candidate for TPA therapy, which is a thrombolytic agent, meaning breaking up blood clots. We call it the clot busting medication. Uh, people can get that if they arrive to the hospital within three to four and a half hours. In some cases, we can use MRI now uh, to uh, give it to patients who woke up with stroke symptoms if uh, the process isn't far enough along. Mm -hmm. And really, this has been going on, TPA has been given for now about 25 years, uh, since the mid-90s. And really, in the last five years, uh, we've proven that endovascular therapy works as well. So the second option, if there's a large blood vessel, which this is about 10% of ischemic strokes, when there's a large blood vessel blocked, we can physically go in through the body. Usually we come from the artery in the leg, sometimes we come from the artery in the wrist, go all the way up with catheters and wires through the neck into the brain and actually uh, plant a treatment device to extract the blood clot out. Wow. Well, wow. let's let's uh, maybe even pull up that video here soon if you can. But uh, so you're you're manually and not just you're not just doing brain surgery. You're going in through the groin Absolutely. or the yeah. arm. Wow. Yep. And then you got to track the system as it goes up. We can actually get from the artery in the leg 
into the brain in a matter of about 15 minutes or so when we're going really quick. And is the patient awake for that? Yep, so my preference is actually to have the patient awake because I can track their neurologic process and how they're doing. In some cases across the country, uh, they will sometimes use anesthesia, but I have found that patients do better when we keep them awake and, and cut out that process because um, the blood pressure tends to stay higher, so they're driving collateral flow, as we were kind of alluding to earlier. Uh, and also, we get an idea how the patient's doing as we're doing this process. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll maybe pull up the other video, uh, Stroke, M-E-R-L-M-C-A. Um, I think that, is that one it there? Yes. Yeah, this is it right here. So that's the CAT scan showing a stroke. This is going to move really fast, but it'll give you a sense of how fast this goes. Uh, this is a scan showing that there's a big, big area that's at risk. And then there's the occlusion there on the left side of the brain and less flow on the left side. And then we quickly access the artery in the leg to go up, take a quick picture, identify the occlusion. You'll see the before and after in a moment. And uh, then we have to get a small microcatheter past it to deplant the treatment device known as a stent retriever, which is in this case here. And you can see the picture of the stent in there connected to a wire to drag the blood clot out. This is after and everything's fully open now, just one treatment attempt. So that's the before in the front to back view and then side to side view. You can see the huge difference in the amount of blood flow. This is what came out in that particular case. And this is an MRI done several hours after and basically shows minimal damage. Uh, so we were able to get to that one quick enough. Some damage was done. But for the most part, minimal damage was done in that particular case, and that patient did great. Uh, was discharged in patient rehab with a very uh, low stroke scale uh, within about three or so days. Um, and if you if you want to see another couple of examples, you could pull up, for example, uh, L M C A M one O C C M E R. Um, and you can just kind of get an idea of the amount of difference in flow before and after. And it, uh, this is a good one here. This is kind of shows a high uh, tech parametric analysis, uh, which basically it shows the before. Those are those vessels that you see on the the screen's right hand side or your left hand side. Those are actually vessels on the outside of the brain that filled, uh, so the contrast wasn't even going into the brain because of the blockage. And you can see where the arrows point toward uh, afterwards. Such a tremendous difference. That's a great example there of the amount of dysfunction that was going on uh, in that person's brain related to the occlusion. And when you're looking at this live, are the colors there then too? Or? No, so that's, that's an analysis which shows the whole angiographic video run. So at, from the beginning and you watch where the contrast goes, this is showing you timing. So the red is where the contrast got to early and the blue is the last part and everything else green and yellow is kind of in between. Uh, and so there's so much dysfunction, contrast wasn't even getting into the brain when we injected the carotid artery uh, on that left side in that case. And then once we're done, uh, perfectly restores flow. And that's another example of somebody that we got to soon enough and they really did truly great, made a great recovery. Wow, wow, that is really remarkable. We have so many great questions, so I think we'll start to, to dive in with Absolutely. some of those here. Um, one caller asks, are strokes connected to any dementia or Alzheimer's? Yeah, actually there is a type of dementia known as vascular dementia or Binswanger disease. It's named after uh, somebody. Uh, this is where there is ongoing ischemic damage to the brain, uh, most strongly correlated with high blood pressure actually, and in some cases smoking, cholesterol, and diabetes. And if there's enough uh, ischemic injury to the brain or what we call chronic white, white matter disease over time, uh, people can actually develop a type of dementia, vascular dementia, which has some similarities to Alzheimer's dementia. Yeah. One person asks, I heard the term word salad. What does this mean? So word salad is uh, a symptom of stroke, uh, or what we refer to in the medical field as aphasia, and it's a processing error in the brain. So if the language center in the brain cortex where language processing takes place is not getting enough blood flow or is becoming injured, uh, people will sometimes speak uh, words that don't make any sense or as they're trying to speak a sentence, it's just these random words or sometimes made up words almost that don't come together in any meaningful way. This is word salad. So sometimes a person might have trouble speaking because of their motor yep. ability to speak. Absolutely. Their, their face is drooping mm -hmm. or whatever. And sometimes it's inside the brain where they can't. Yeah, this, and this is a great area to distinguish that even sometimes physicians uh, have a hard time understanding as well. But it's 
aphasia, which is language processing, the words kind of come out in a word salad or you can't speak at all, or uh, dysarthria, which is where the throat muscles that are needed for enunciation and pronunciation of words are actually weak. And typically you'll see one half of the body weak with that. And then the words come out more slurred, almost like you have peanut butter in your mouth. Hmm. Um, is there more advanced treatments for patients that had a stroke in the past and have lost feeling in the arm or the side of the mouth? You know, I think that we're looking at some of the damage done. Yeah, and this is an area that we honestly, being 2020, we still have a long ways to go. Uh, restorative therapies is an area where we're looking at now with research, and you know, there's a lot of that being done. Um, but the brain is such a complex organ, um, and when you lose a certain part of it, uh, you know, we find that um, obviously some recovery does happen, even up to a year out with good rehab. Um, but it's hard to get back uh, completely back to normal. You know, the, everybody's heard about stem cell therapies and things. It's, it's even more complicated when it's related to the central nervous system in the brain. But this, this, these are things that are absolutely being looked at, and hopefully we'll find something for these patients. And that's exciting, too. I mean, just these, how, how what we're doing right now, we couldn't do. I mean, this is new in the last how many years? Last five to ten years, for wow. sure. Wow. You know, going back, looking at some of the risk factors, there was, you know, high cholesterol we mentioned. So what are the dangers of high cholesterol? How does that tie into this? And, and what does good cholesterol mean, they ask? Yep. So, you know, cholesterol is this complex issue that I think we've really learned a lot more about in the last five to 10 years as well. You know, it used to be that LDL was considered the bad cholesterol and HDL was considered the good cholesterol. And, you know, Essentially, that is true, but we now know that there are actually subtypes of LDL, and some of the particles that carry cholesterol are more fluffy. Some of them are more, uh, more dense, and they, they look different. They act different. And from a genetic perspective, uh, we all uh, have different subtypes of bad cholesterol. Uh, so there's testing panels and things that can be done. But for the most part, from a simple sense, uh, in general, LDL is bad cholesterol, HDL is good cholesterol, and you want to have the proper balance. If your LDL cholesterol is too high, uh, it does lead to deposits of cholesterol plaque in vessels, which then can become inflamed, break off, and cause strokes, for example. Yeah. We had talked about atrial fibrillation and irregular heart rhythm, which can increase your risk of a stroke. One caller asked if a pacemaker can help. So pacemakers, uh, what, what they do is actually get the heart back into a normal rhythm. So it's, there are some similarities, but it's different. It's, an, it's a different electrical problem, typically where the heart isn't beating correctly, and it's more typically the whole heart. So they'll actually put wires into parts of the heart muscle to stimulate it to stay on pace and beat properly. Atrial fibrillation is a little bit of a different issue. Um, a, another emailer asks, it, that's 87 years old, never a smoker, has both an atrial and ventricular heart arrhythmia, an irregular heart rhythm for, from a couple causes, has a pacemaker. Her INR, so that's how you know, thin her blood is, mm -hmm. is at 2.3, which is a good spot. Uh, it works out, cross-training, 15, 15 to 17 minutes, doing resistance, uh, heart goes to 92, 98. She's wondering if these exercises and resistance training and cross training is putting her at increased risk. I don't think so. Uh, you know, even even younger folks in, in their 30s and 40s that that work out like crazy and 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 run marathons. You know, we find that some of these people uh, seem to be at increased risk for some of these health issues because of structural changes in the heart. Mm -hmm. um, but. For, for, for what that particular person is mentioning, uh, I, I would really doubt that. And in, in fact, I would encourage exercise. And you know, the brain, as well as muscles, you, know, you use it or you lose it. And, and exercise is an important part of actually activating a part of our genetics, which uh, uh, do maintenance. So as a pre prevention for a stroke, um, sometimes we recommend aspirin. And so one, one caller asks, why is a blood thinner necessary to patients once they reach the age of 75? And what would you, when would you recommend aspirin for primary prevention? Perhaps? This this is a, a very loaded topic, and you know as well as a primary <laughs> care provider, uh, we've we've gone back and forth on this in medicine many times. The most recent recommendation is that uh, for primary prevention, meaning you've never had a heart attack or a stroke, we actually say don't take aspirin. That's the most recent hot off the press stuff. A number of years ago, we used to say men between the ages of 45 and 75 take a baby aspirin, but oh, but once you turn 75, you don't take it anymore. It, it's more complex than that. And essentially, when they looked at 
thousands and thousands of patients who were or were not taking aspirin, they found that there was just a slightly increased risk uh, for causing some sort of bleeding problem, even from a baby aspirin, as opposed to helping. And so now, if you haven't had an issue, the general recommendation is don't take one. And might be worth it, talk to your doctor at least. Absolutely, anyway. it's, it's a complex issue, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, this person asks, and you're doing a great job with these, sorry, you're, you're the only one I'm asking. I can answer some too, yep. sorry. Uh, is a stroke the same as a brain aneurysm? Well, we were talking about the brain aneurysm was that ballooning out, yep. and where a stroke is, is where there's that blockage or a bleed going on. Exactly, and an aneurysm can cause a type of stroke. It causes subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is also pretty much classified with hemorrhagic strokes. But in a sense, when people refer to the word stroke, usually they're referring to ischemic stroke, which is the more common one. So if someone has a brain known brain aneurysm and it hasn't ruptured, it's not an urgent you know, situation, can we do anything to help keep it from rupturing? Yeah, absolutely. So we actually will sometimes electively uh, choose to go in and fix the aneurysm, whether that be endovascular, which is something that I do. We block up the aneurysm with platinum coils and sometimes use devices to divert flow away from the aneurysm uh, to let it heal. Uh, and then what's been done for many more years and is also still a good treatment is a neurosurgeon comes from the outside and actually places a clip across the neck of the aneurysm to disconnect it from circulation. Now, not all patients need this, right? This treatment still has some risks associated with it. So we only do it if we think the aneurysm has a high risk of rupture. Um, we kind of covered on a TIA, transient ischemic attack, a mini stroke, and this person asked what are some of the signs and symptoms of that? Yeah, so just, uh, just like we talked about signs and symptoms of stroke, they're literally the same for TIA. It's, it's that same FAST acronym to remember, so sudden onset changes in facial weakness, speech, arm leg weakness, sensation loss, vision changes, uh, all of these things apply. But other than it might just go away after half an hour. Exactly, or and if it does go away, that doesn't mean go, don't go to the emergency room. You still should because it is a sign that you know, more of this could come, and, yeah. and it should be checked out so we can uh, hopefully help prevent that. Well, here's a good question from Facebook. What is the difference between a stroke and Bell's palsy? Oh, that is a good question. So a stroke is actually happening in the brain, uh, so the brain itself, the, the processing center or the connections in the brain are what we refer to as the CNS, central nervous system. Bell's palsy is actually an injury of a peripheral nerve. So it's the seventh cranial nerve that comes from the brain stem from the brain and it's actually outside in the peripheral nervous system. So sometimes we think it's associated with a viral infection, um, uh, but typically it is an injury to that nerve which then causes weakness of the face because that's what the seventh nerve does. So it's a difference in location of where the problem is. So nothing that we can treat with how what we've been talking Correct. about. Correct. Yeah, it's a different issue. Now there are sometimes uh, antiviral medications or steroids which are used for that, but it is a different issue. This person specifically asks, uh, or, or what are some signs that a person is having a hemorrhagic stroke, which is there any difference? Can you tell from the symptoms if it's a hemorrhagic or ischemic stroke? Yeah, it's, it's actually pretty difficult to tell. I have, I have been fooled many times. One thing I would say is uh, typically they have the onset of stroke symptoms and it's, it does tend to be more associated with headache when it's related to hemorrhage. And then the other thing I've noticed is that typically patients continue to have a stepwise decline, whereas in ischemic stroke, it's usually maximal at onset and kind of holds. You know, we cut, we, once again, we had talked about atrial fibrillation and irregular heart rhythm, but then there's, this person asks about SVT. Mm -hmm. How serious is SVT or does that increase your risk of a stroke? So SVT um, uh, where, where it's really fast, right? A supraventricular tachycardia. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the difference there is is that in, in this case the ventricle or the larger chamber of the heart on the left side is actually the one that's beating fast. Whereas in atrial fibrillation uh, or atrial flutter, the, the atrial chamber is the one that's kind of vibrating and not communicating properly, but the ventricle chamber is still beating pretty much normally, and sometimes it can go a little faster as well. So typically, they still have that synchrony in SVT to where it's less likely to cause blood clots. You didn't know I'd be asking you heart questions. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Dabble in cardiology. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. That's good. Could strokes be associated with anger outbursts? Um, an anterior choroidal artery stroke relation. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, so it depends on which part of the brain is affected. See, for example, if you talk about the liver, right? The liver is, every cell in the liver kind of does the same thing. 
Whereas in the brain, everything is so compartmentalized, it depends on where the injury is. So uh, pertaining to that example, if you have an injury in the frontal lobes, mm. which are where our personalities kind of take place, uh, planning long term, uh, having a filter in conversation, these kinds mm -hmm. of things, uh, absolutely that can become affected in stroke. So uh, anger problems, depression, these are all things that can happen with stroke, particularly when that part of the brain is affected. Granted, if it's happening over time or gradually, there certainly might be other causes of dementia that might be Absolutely. causing that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah, these uh, uh, neurodegenerative changes uh, associated with dementia and these things can also lead to those items. Yeah. So we, you know, we want to encourage people to recognize the symptoms and to get help right away. What are some of the things that we're doing to, to help speed up the care in the emergency department? Yeah, absolutely. So not only changing the whole paradigm of how the patient is evaluated, kind of like we were talking about, but in addition, there's some really, really neat things that are really have only been used in the last couple of years. Um, there is artificial intelligence, which really you know, has existed outside of healthcare, we know for a long time. Uh, we're just now starting to more so in healthcare use AI to help us detect problems and guide care. As an example of this, uh, at Avera McKinnon, we're using AI software uh, to help us detect large vessel occlusions or big blood vessels that are blocked when somebody has an ischemic stroke and to help us get, get an idea that this is happening sooner uh, so that we can intervene more quickly. So uh, AI in healthcare, particularly in stroke, is something that's very real now and we are literally using this now and it is making a difference because it's helping cut down treatment times, particularly within our referral centers. Uh, Brookings Hospital, for example, would be a location in which you know, we will be implementing this to help identify this problem faster because by identifying the problem faster, we get that patient transferred to a center which is capable of doing uh, mechanical thrombectomy uh, so that they can get help more quickly. And it's going to make a huge difference and already has. Yeah, I understand that, you know, that, that when they get that CT scan, it gets, gets right to the, to the top of the list and the artificial intelligence computer can analyze and say here's here's one that they could get help right away and you get alerted I understand yeah it's and it's fascinating because you know the old pathway in which this would take place uh, let's say you go to Mitchell or the Brookings emergency room and your ER doctor suspects you're having a stroke they order the CAT scan and they're, they're you know they do vessel imaging and let's say that scan happens to have a large vessel occlusion and the patient patient has severe symptoms well the old pathway is a radiologist gets cued to read a stat study. Uh, they have a time in which they have to do this, uh, 15 minutes maybe for example, and let's say they read that study. They have to go through it and go through the whole thing. Okay, well there's a vessel occlusion. They call the ear doctor and say, hey this looks like a problem and then you know, is there clinically something going on? Yes, this person's having severe stroke symptoms. So then they call the transfer center, get a neurologist on the phone and they say, well we can maybe give them TPA but this is a large vessel occlusion, now we need a neurointerventionalist. And so then they, they, they call somebody like me. So imagine how much time goes by in that time frame. Whereas if you have AI, which can automatically say with 95% accuracy, large vessel occlusion, alert stroke team uh, at thrombectomy capable center, of Vera McKinnon for example, uh, and we get an alert immediately. So now we're calling the ear and saying, hey, it sounds like you, you, know, you have a, a patient so with a them really waiting, problem. you know, them yes. calling you, you're calling them even. Yeah, it really cuts the process down tremendously. And so one of the metrics we look at is door in, door out, or dido time. So the amount of time the patient actually spends at a referral center is going to cut down dramatically because of AI. Yeah. Finally, we're using technology yes. and medicine for, <laughs> for good. No, Absolutely. It's always been for good, but yeah. we're working on it. Um, uh, stroke versus viral encephalitis. Yeah, so actually, uh, in rare cases, uh, viruses can actually cause uh, strokes. It can cause vasculitis, which is inflammation of blood vessels in the brain, uh, or in the other, other parts of the body as well, but in this case, in the brain. Um, so in some cases, vessels can have uh, spasm or changes which can lead to problems with blood flow and can lead to stroke as well. It's, it's one of the uh, very rare causes of stroke. Hmm. Wow. And typically it does not cause stroke, but it can. So looking to the future now, um, you know, is there anything we can do to limit the damage and prolong the time allowed to treat a stroke? Because right now we have to move so quickly and that's what we're focused on, but is there anything we could maybe do or are doing to help 
prolong the amount of time we can to help? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, there, th this is stuff that's going on in some of our leading academic institutions in the United States as well as internationally. And even when I was a vascular neurology fellow uh, in training at the University of Utah in Salt Lake, we were part of a trial uh, in which in addition to giving that clot-busting medication TPA when patients were having an ischemic stroke, we were actually trying to give them a substance which would buy them more time. So damage is happening and we're trying to reverse the process and it kind of sometimes takes time for the, the TPA medication to work or endovascular therapy, for example. And this drug was supposed to get to the injured site and sort of allow the cells to hang on a little bit longer and maybe help them regenerate faster. And so that was just one example uh, of a research trial where this is going on, and it, it showed that it potentially helped a little bit. We have a long ways to go, but we are looking hard to try and do this. I, uh, you and I actually had talked about this a couple days ago, and, and I was joking about how wouldn't it be amazing if we had this uh, substance in which we could put the brain in suspended animation and actually do the procedure electively at 8 a.m. the next morning instead of 3 a.m. <laughs> yeah, in the middle of the yeah. night. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't exist yet, but I think that's sure. something that we're trying to head towards sure. uh, to allow everybody to be able to benefit from this. Yeah. You know, as we, you know, they think about things like, you know, freezing the stroke or, you know, is that something they can maybe do? Or? It's, it's not there yet. Um, we've tried okay. all kinds of things, yeah. including giving things as simple as magnesium in the ambulance. Yeah. Uh, which didn't help, um, but you know we're certainly trying to find those things which might prolong time or even freeze the process to allow you to be able to get to it when you can get to it. Because if you're in the middle of nowhere yeah. and you have this process uh, yeah. and whatever time it takes to identify it, uh, you still have to get sent to a center where it can be managed. But well, we showed on the video that we can help. It can help. You get the hell. You, get, you find out right away. You get the helicopter. Yes. So, bottom line here was a recap in our final minute. Yeah. Here, what what is your message you like to give to everyone here tonight? Yeah, I think the most important thing to understand is is that you know stroke is truly an emergency. Um, severe sudden onset headache, like the flip of a light switch. All these things are so important, and you got to get help fast. Don't wait around to see if it gets better. Uh, don't not go because it happened and got better. Get help right away because there's, there is potentially a lot that we can do for you that can really change your life long term. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. And now for the answer to tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. Which of the following is the single most important controllable risk factor for stroke? A. Smoking. B. High blood pressure. C. High cholesterol. D, diabetes, or E, obesity? The answer is B. Hypertension, high blood pressure, is the single most important modifiable risk factor for ischemic stroke. The winner of tonight's quiz is Ellen Conry, Conroy from Custer, South Dakota. Thank you, Ellen, for participating. A book will be sent to you in the mail soon. And as a reminder, please go see your doctor and get those, all those are important. Stopping smoking, getting your blood pressure checked and under control, and working on diabetes and obesity and, and exercising and eating healthy. Those are all things we need to do to help prevent our risk of stroke. We'll be right back after this. For nearly two decades, the Prairie Doc organization has endeavored to enhance health and diminish suffering by providing useful information based on honest science in a respectful and compassionate manner. Health professionals volunteer to answer your questions each week, creating a vast Prairie Doc library of medical information available to you and your family 24 hours a day. Make sure you don't miss a thing. Follow the Prairie Doc on Facebook and YouTube for free and easy access to the entire Prairie Doc Library. Sudden weakness on one side of the body, slurred speech, facial drooping, inability to find or understand words, these are symptoms of a stroke. It could be subtle or it could be severe. Regardless, rapid diagnosis and treatment is the key to recovery. Not long ago, not much could have been done for someone if they had a stroke. Often we could only wait and see how the patient recovered. Prevention was the only tool we had to combat strokes. Blood pressure control, aspirin or other blood thinners, cholesterol control, and of course, a healthy diet and exercise remain especially important. Thankfully, today we have a few more options. 
Clot-busting medications are a great advancement in the treatment of strokes. If diagnosed soon enough, sometimes clot-busting medications can work to break up a clot that was blocking blood flow in an area of the brain and restore circulation. This can help to preserve or at least minimize the area of the brain that was affected. There are risks, such as bleeding, but they may be worth it. To minimize risks, this medication can only be prescribed if certain criteria are met, such as onset of symptoms less than four and a half hours prior to treatment, age limitations, medical history, blood test results, and exclusion of it being a hemorrhagic stroke. Hemorrhagic strokes are bleeding strokes, when damage is done from a bleed in the brain rather than from a clot in the brain. Typically, a CT scan is needed to make sure a stroke is not a hemorrhagic stroke. Even more recent developments resulted in the ability to manually remove a clot in the brain and restore circulation. Highly specialized, this new procedure seems almost miraculous. Similar to an angioplasty restoring circulation in a blocked artery in the heart, now specialists can insert a catheter into an artery in the arm or groin, advance it up to the clot, and remove it, restoring circulation to the affected area of the brain. Some patients experience a rapid resolution of their symptoms following this new procedure, where before they may never have been expected to regain the function of one side of their body, now they may be able to walk out of the hospital the next day. The keys are recognition and time. Know the signs and get help quickly. Think of the acronym FAST. Face drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulty, time to call 911. A big thank you to Dr. Alex Lin for volunteering his time to help us learn more about the current treatment for strokes. If you would like more information about tonight's program or to see and hear more episodes of On Call with Prairie Doc, please like and follow us on Facebook and YouTube or visit us at prairiedoc.org. And be sure to look for the podcast of this program, Prairie Doc On Call, wherever you get your podcasts. Now that we are into October, the flu season is close at hand. Please get the flu vaccine. It is an important step to help protect you as we go through the winter. That does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. A diagnosis of cancer can be frightening. It often makes us reorder our priorities and affects our daily life. Tools for fighting cancer, next time, on call with the Prairie Doc. Useful science-based health information delivered in a respectful and compassionate manner. This is what we all receive from the Prairie Docs. Hello, my name is Dave Hank, and I serve on the board of the Healing Words Foundation. Our organization works to build financial support for Prairie Doc programs. We thank our four Prairie Docs and the many health providers who volunteer their time to answer our health questions. However, significant funding is required to produce and distribute video, radio, and print programs throughout the region. Your donations can help us continue the Prairie Doc legacy. On behalf of the Healing Words Foundation Board, please join us in our mission. Go to prairiedoc.org and click the donate button today. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call with the Prairie Doc on South Dakota Public Broadcasting.
Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, Fishback Financial Corporation, South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Vance Thompson Vision, Black Hills Medical Society, Brookings Madison Flandreau District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Urology Specialists, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Lake Ponset Sailing Academy, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Dakota Bank, South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swift Tail Communications.